again, funding equals freedom. If you want true freedom, you got to own and understand the entire capital stack. Um, you got to make relationships with everybody um, and understand that you, even if you're the CEO of your business, you still have a boss and the boss is the capital stack. The boss is the money, right? So the bank, the mezzanine equity or the mezzanine debt or the pref equity, and then your mom and pop investors that fund that last piece of the capital stack, ultimately you work for them. They're the money. As an operator, I know other investors are romanticizing multifamily investing, and I'm looking to learn from other investors' mistakes. I know you are too, and you found the right place. Welcome to Myers Methods Presents Multifamily Missteps. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Myers Methods Presents Multifamily Missteps. I'm your jo host, Jerome. I don't know, man. I'm getting jammed up today. And I have the fortune of having my main man from Ohio, Josh Cantwell. How are you, man? I'm doing good, Jerome. Thanks for having me on. Man, I'm grateful you guys made time for me. You're moving and shaking. You're doing these deals. I get emails. I feel like I get an email at least once a week. Hey, we got a new offering. Oh, that one's closed. We got another one coming and you're just <laughs> hitting and hitting and hitting it. But, you know, for the listeners who may not be familiar with you, tell them about the podcast. Tell them a little bit about your experience. Give them all the goodies. Yeah, yeah. So short, short version. Um, so I run a brand uh, called Accelerated Real Estate Investor. Uh, we have a super successful podcast. Jerome's been a guest. Thanks for coming on. Um, and we also run our trainings, live events, uh, courses, all under the Accelerated Real Estate Investor brand. Uh, I've been doing it for over 15 years. For the first 10 years or so, uh, I was a residential investor, buying, fixing, flipping, short sales, wholesaling. Uh, about 2015, uh, we started a private equity fund and we started lending, uh, doing private money and hard money loans uh, to residential and commercial investors. And I started investing in uh, multifamily and large apartment buildings, basically co-sponsoring, co-GPing, uh, co-syndicating deals with some friends of mine. Uh, and now we own 3,700 units of apartments. We've done 15 large syndications. Uh, we have about a $300 million portfolio. I don't own all of that 300 million, but a big chunk of it's mine. Um, and uh, I'm a pancreatic cancer survivor. So I am a blessed man and uh, I'm excited to be on the show and share with your group. Wow, wow, wow. You just slipped that in. Pancreatic cancer survivor. Yeah, Some people yeah. just say, Ugh, I, I'm done. I'll just hang it up and ride off into the sunset. But I think you hit a new gear after that. Is that a true statement for you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, it was it was a real inflection point. I think you have an opportunity at certain points of your life, uh, unless you're a regular, uh, you know, kind of getting through therapy, really spend a lot of time thinking. Uh, one of my favorite books is Think Like a Monk by Jay Shetty and spend a lot of time really uh, just you know, thinking about my journey and thinking about the future. Uh, but that particular moment, which was November, 2011, you know, forces you to kind of take inventory of what you've done. You really have to look at your life and take a real, real hard look at what kind of things you would be regretting, what kind of things that you've accomplished. And honestly, look, you know, look life and death directly in the eyes and say, okay, what, what, if I make it through this, what am I going to do differently? Um, and that was my, that was the time when I really came back and realized I'd done a lot of things well, uh, but I had done a lot of things in business that I didn't do well. I was really focused. I was very transactional in, in nature before that. Uh, and I realized that funding, uh, getting funding, access to money of all different kinds, shapes and sizes, funding equals freedom. That was my big takeaway business-wise uh, when I was sick. And I realized that if I wanted to be truly financially free, that I had to basically own the entire capital stack. And if I owned the entire capital stack and knew everything about the capital stack, knew how to get the money, relationships, network for the capital stack, then I could buy anything I wanted. And then it was all about owning the asset and the owning the asset created the financial independence 
to be able to do what I want and do what when I want and work with the people I want, and grow our portfolio. Uh, so that was that was a huge inflection point for me because I think a lot of people get into a certain type of real estate. Let's say it's residential, maybe it's fix and flips or wholesaling. And they realize, you know, shit, I, I really got into real estate for the financial freedom. This doesn't feel like financial freedom because I'm always on the hamster wheel. Um, and so I was kind of in that trap. I had been really good at it for about five or seven years. And I was like, well, I don't want to change it because I'm really good at it. I'm making good money, but I was not financially free. Uh, it was really that inflection point of pancreatic cancer that made me rethink about the assets that I owned, the deals that I was buying. And, uh, you know, really focus on owning the asset. That's ultimately uh, what's allowed me to achieve all the success that we've had lately. So uh, I, I, I attribute a lot of our success uh, to that amazing and crazy diagnosis and experience. Wow. That's a great equalizer, or at least looking that thing in the eye and saying, nah, not today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I, it wasn't really up to me, Jerome. And this is where I think you kind of got to realize there's so many things in, the, in life that you know, you have to really be, yeah, I think the one thing people don't take enough time to do is think, like truly think, sit right in a quiet place, meditate and think about where they're going and what they want to do. So many of us are just on this hamster wheel, running around like a crazy animal. Like we were designed, God designed us to be higher level thinkers, bigger picture people, and so many people in this world today are bouncing around like any squirrel I can see in these woods behind me, just bam, 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 you know, like shiny object syndromes, chasing, ch you know, chasing just anything that comes by. And I think that's the big uh, opportunity and the big challenge for every entrepreneur in today's market is to sit and think about what they're really trying to do and realize that yesterday is gone. And if we're only focused on the future, what I can do tomorrow, what I can do with the next day, what, you know, even if I, yesterday was a challenge and I kind of failed, what can I do today? Because I can reset. I've been given a new day. I've been given another opportunity. I don't need to fail and focus on that. Um, and so I, I, I'm lucky because I get to coach Jerome. I coach volleyball. I coach young girls at very high level competitive volleyball, you know, and when they make a mistake, I tell them they have to have a short memory. They've got to forget what just happened. Maybe they missed a serve or they bumped the ball out of bounds or they spiked the ball into the net. Why do we tell young kids, don't worry, it's okay. But then as adults, all we do is hunker down and focus on the things that we effed up, right? And then that stops us from the next point. So if you take this life we have now as mature adults and relate this to seventh grade volleyball, say, well, what would I, what would I tell a young kid if they struck out, right? If they dropped the game winning touchdown in the end zone, missed the game winning three pointer in basketball, I would tell them, keep shooting, keep playing, keep going. You can do it. But as adults, it's like we have a divorce. We have a business screw up. We, we, we miss out on a multifamily deal. We have a deal that goes bad that we lose money on. And all of a sudden we clam up and we stop trying. So that's the gift that pancreatic cancer has given me is the, uh, the ability to realize that whatever happened yesterday is not going to impact, doesn't have to impact, only I, I am responsible for letting it impact my future. And you realize that, man, you missed out on a deal today, there's a new deal coming tomorrow. It's a real sort of kind of monkey off your back, weight off your shoulder to realize that there's always the next day. Woo, we we getting deep already, ladies and gentlemen. You're hearing it here on Multifamily Missteps. Okay, so with that as the backdrop, Josh, it, you said like 3,700 units. Like all those deals go perfectly, right? You make money every single time, uh -huh. and your performers are exactly as you place them. And you know there are no surprises behind the walls because you're a value add guy. So I mean. We should just end it here and let everybody know that yeah. multifamily investing is what they should do, right? We've never made a mistake. <laughs> yeah, no, there's, 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 there's challenges all the time. Now, we're very fortunate, as most multifamily investors are today, that the market is good. The market's rising. Prices are going up. Uh, cap rates are going down. Interest rates are relatively low. So it's been hard to make major mistakes because even when we have made mistakes, which we have, the market's bailed us out, right? Um, and so the challenge is going to be, the real challenge is the operator 
who screws up when the market's going down. That's ultimately the biggest challenge. And I think, you know, right now, a lot of people see the market, the market's good, it's competitive, you know, uh, prices are going up, rent rates are going up, uh, you know, cap rates are going down, valuations are going up. But now herein lies the challenge, right? Supplies are hard to get, labor's hard to get, uh, you know, things are backed up as far as basic stuff like doors, toilets, sinks, granite, some of the stuff is backed up. And so now you're finding that you're going to see some defaults. You're going to see some more missteps. And then ultimately, prices are going to start to contract at some point uh, in the next few years. And then you're going to find out if somebody's a good operator or not. But yeah, to, to your point, Jerome, we've screwed up plenty. Uh, but the market's bailed us out for the most part for the last five or six years. So, and this is the part that I think a lot of people miss. They believe that if the market bailed them out, that they didn't actually make the mistake. Oh, sure. It's just not true. It's, just, it's, you know, baseball, I think, is the only game where they actually count the mistakes that were made in addition to the score, yeah. right? But as an operator, you know, you can just kind of sweep it under the rug. Like, we have a project where we're probably going to triple people's money in it. But we ruined the construction for the first year and a half. Like, we just totally messed it up, right? Right. And it's like, well, you know, cap rate compression, prices, scarcity, all these things are colluding in order to give us what we want on the backside. But, boy, I mean, had, had we truly had the tide go out, they would have saw that we were swimming with no swimming trunks at the, yeah. right. <laughs> at the wrong time. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that's that, – that, so – some 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 true examples right so um i partnered up with some good friends of mine we bought thousands of units in 2017 18 19 and there was a lot of talk within our group and our partnership about are we moving too fast well at the beginning none of that none of that you know really shakes out none of it really matters because you're just continuing to move you're continuing to turn units you're continuing to do capex you're paying your preferred returns. In some cases, we had to overraise, so we had enough money in the operating account to pay the preferred return, and then COVID hit. Right now, part of the portfolio that we own was in Albany, Georgia, down outside of Atlanta, and Macon. Well, that was like an epicenter for COVID. I mean, we literally had people die in our apartment buildings, and the fire department and EMS taking people out of our apartment buildings in body bags. Right, so really tough situation. And it got to the point where the residents were so scared uh, of COVID that they would not let us in their units. So we couldn't move residents. We couldn't move them from, we could, we couldn't, our plan was buy the buildings, turn the vacants, then move the existing residents into the improved units, and then go back and fill the ones that were just vacant. Pretty simple strategy. A lot of people do it. Well, if your new uh, units, you've turned them all and you've done that, but now the current residents don't want to move. They don't even want to let you in the unit because they're so afraid of COVID because the guy down the hall just died of COVID. Literally, they won't let you in their unit. So you can't improve the rent. You can't do the CapEx plan. And some of these people started playing the eviction moratorium game. Not a lot, but definitely enough. The whole business plan goes, right? Because you've turned the first group, let's say the first 30 units, or the first 20%, now you're stuck. Like, what, the, what do you do? And you've got just enough cash flow to kind of pay the bills, right? And you're not making a profit. And in some cases, you're actually bleeding a little bit because the whole business model was built off of turning more units to improve the cash flow to get cash flow positive. And there's this little thing called COVID right in the middle of the whole the whole business plan, right? So real, real, uh, now, was it a misstep? I don't know. You know, it would definitely monk, threw a huge monkey wrench in the business plan for sure. Was it a misstep? Because it really sort of out of our control, sort of out of our control, right? But certainly now where do we get bailed out? Well, now those buildings that we bought for 20, 30, 40 a door, are now selling. We you know we bought them. We we got like a ten or an eleven cap. We were thought they were going to be able to refi at like a six and a half or a seven. Now they're selling at a six. 
And so just because the market's gotten so much better, interest rates are down, cap rates are down, we got bailed out. Um, now, if we didn't get bailed out by the market, Jerome, what we could have, what we, what we are doing and what we continue to do is just continue with the business plan now that things are normalizing. We're moving some of those residents out. We're collecting the money through the government subsidies that are available for the, uh, you know, the eviction, the people that couldn't pay. We're executing on all of that. But if the market was also going down right now, I could tell you that part of the portfolio might be in trouble. No question, right? And it's all assumptions, it's guesses. Assumptions are a, fav a fancy word for guesses, right? I mean, yeah. and the market can change in any moment. And it's definitely market by market. And even it could be neighborhood by neighborhood, depending on what market you're in. And so I, I think you illuminate an amazing point that so people, so few people are willing to raise, which is, look, I'm doing this based on what I think I know but I don't actually know. I, I can't see into the future. Projections, that's the fancy way of saying educated guess, right? 1000%. Because it really, and, is, it really is. And then when you do it at scale, right? It, it only amplifies the issue if there is an issue. Now, mm -hmm. with that said, um, you mentioned the cost basis that you bought things at. Yeah. And this is where I talk to people about having some cushion, right? And the cushion is this, I can't build it for that. Mm -hmm. Like there is, it's going to be really hard for me to lose here. Even if I just need to buy time and service the debt until we can get back to a place where we can get the units available at the premiums that we get from renovating them. Mm -hmm. I can't do that if I pay full market rent for a construction project or yeah. full market rate for a construction project. And yeah, I'm seeing people do that, Josh. And I know you are too, because you, you guys aren't buying everything. You're buying what actually makes sense. So what, what do you say to the investors who's like, man, I just got to get a deal done. You know, yeah. I, a lot of people want to be profitable multifamily operators, but lack the knowledge, deal flow, experience, and capital to be successful. They often try to overcome these challenges out of order, slowing or eliminating their ability to get their next deal done. We've developed a framework that allows them to gain the knowledge they need to find profitable deals. When they do, they create the time and location freedom, as well as the generational wealth they desire for their family. The Myers methods of multifamily investing have proved to be the fastest way to establish credibility and properly grow an apartment portfolio. If you want to know more about our four-step process, jump over to MyersMethods.com to get our free four-step guide to getting into multifamily investing. Let's get back to the episode. I would say, look, don't, don't do the deal. Don't just get a deal done. I would rather not do a deal at all. I'd be totally comfortable if we didn't buy anything for the next year to 18 months and just operated what we had and really, really just cherry picked the stuff. I think in this market, uh, knowing, okay, there's a couple things going on, Jerome. So we know last year was kind of a pencils down year. That was like the term a lot of people use. Now there was plenty of deals that traded. We bought plenty of deals last year. 2020, but because of COVID, it was kind of pencils down. There wasn't as many deals that traded. So those pushed into this year. Now, because of the threat of these uh, possible increases, the Biden administration talking about getting rid of the 1031 exchange or the step up in basis, higher capital gains taxes, we're seeing for sure people that wouldn't have sold for three, five, seven years from now, they're all selling this year to lock in their gains and lock in under today's tax code. So this next six months, you're going to see a historic I'm predicting record number of trades and people are going to be trying to just get the deal done, get the deal done, get the deal done. What I'm going to, what I'm predicting is that there's cap rates are going to continue to go down. Values are still going to go up this year because there's still going to be so much competition, competition, competition. Then next year, all this tech stuff will normalize out. The supply chain will normalize out. Uh, cap rates might even go up a little bit. I think they're going to go down this year even further because of competition, and they're going to go up next year a little bit. And what you're going to see is a lot of people are going to overpay in the next six months. They're going to be dying to get deals. They're going to be dying. The brokers are going to be like, I just saw a deal in Euclid, Ohio. Euclid, Ohio, a year or two ago, 40 a door. Went and walked a deal two weeks ago. They're asking nearly 80 a door. 
for this same deal I could have bought two, three years ago for 40 or 45 a door. Now we made an offer at 57 a door and we're in the game because of just our buying power, right? We, we, they know we're not nearly the highest offer, but we're the most qualified buyer, right? So I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of stretching on that deal a little bit, but I'm not going to stretch any further. Other people are, what, they're, at, they're offering half a million or a million more than we are. That's the mistake that's going to happen, right? So I, I'm very comfortable in making the best offers I can and losing out on deals this year because I know that next year, a lot of those guys are going to blow their wad. They're going to spend all their money. They're going to screw up some deals. Then they're going to be thinking, oh shit, I overpaid. So next year in 2022, I'm going to be, we're going to be total animals about making amazing offers and scooping up everything we can. I think this next six months, we, you got to be very careful about not overpaying. Wow. Wow. You guys are getting the crystal ball here. Josh is letting you in <laughs> behind the curtains. Okay. So don't overpay. Got it. Cause cost right. basis makes everything right. So and this is one of the big differences I see, and I don't really talk about this a whole lot, but the biggest difference I see between single family and multifamily is I really think single families are widgets, right? You buy it at this price, you sell it at another price, you're done. With multifamily, you buy it at this price, you execute it and operate at this a fairly, I don't know, good way. I don't have any eloquent word to put there. You operate it well, and then you sell it at this price. But if you don't operate it well, the price doesn't go up. That's right. In right. fact, it probably goes down. Yeah, you you can you can improve an apartment building in a bad market and and still win because you're a good operator. And you know we've been lucky the last five years because there's a lot of terrible operators who are getting bailed out by a good market. So you're not really seeing like it, it, like everybody looks like an all star right now, right? Everybody looks like an all star. It's like everybody's playing on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and they won the Super Bowl. Everybody's playing with LeBron James and everybody's winning the NBA championship. That everybody looks good, but like the market is bailing everybody out. So let's take the superstar off the team. And in our world, the superstar is a rising market. You take the superstar off the team. Now you realize what the other operators, the other players, are they really good or not? Right. Are they really good or not? You take LeBron off the Lakers. And even if you leave Anthony Davis on the Lakers, what about the other six or seven guys? They're not winning an NBA championship, right? Even this year, you take the, the Bucks, you take Giannis off the team, or you take CP3 off the Suns. Th that's the superstar that's making it go. In our world, in the multifamily world, it's a rising market is the all-star. That's the MVP. You take the MVP off the team, and a lot of people are in trouble. So a couple of things that we've done to make sure that we're not relying on just the MVP right? We're not relying on the market to bail us out. One of the things, one of the specific things we did with that, 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 um, that Albany, Georgia portfolio is we were self-managing the leasing, the, the kickouts, the collections, self-managing the property management, and we were doing heavy value add. What we decided to do was get rid of our self-management, bring in professional property management, like the asset livings of the world, uh, the Lincolns of the world, the Trinity multifamilies of the world, bring them in so they could focus on uh, the units, the leasing, the collections, getting money from like the free government slush money for the people that applied for the, uh, the, the, the rental assistance, making sure they do all that because it's such a big portfolio. So we could focus just on CapEx. Okay. So one of the ways we solve the problem is by bringing in professional third-party help for that part of the portfolio, because we feel like the money is really made. Like there's so many, there, like when you think about multifamily drum, there's so many good property, third-party property management companies. Nobody talks about really good CapEx companies. So where you really win as an operator is in your CapEx plan. It's unit turns, it's providing amenities, dog parks, soccer fields, landscaping and mulch, ceiling and striping driveways, roofs, uh, pools, adding you know, keyless entry, all these. That's the value add. The value add is not just in charging more rent. That's easy. Any property management company can do that. So we thought we got to focus on what we can really, really, really control that adds value to the building. If we do an amazing job with CapEx, the rents are just going to go up. 
it's going to be easy for the property manager to charge more rent. We're going to make them look like all-stars. So we decided to focus on the super niche part of the business. The one thing that we could do better than anybody else, which is CapEx. That's where my focus is right now, man. And everything we own is making sure we lock in all the CapEx, everything that we need to refinance, refinance it in the next year, lock in these low rates again, before these tax changes happen next year. We've got to get that done right now in the next six to 12 months. Wow. But nobody wants to do the construction, Josh. That's the hard part. What are you talking about, man? Who wants to run contractors? Yeah, and nobody wants to do that. And, you know, if you want to be the MVP, you want to be LeBron, you want to be Tom Brady, you want to be, uh, you know, Cristiano Ronaldo, you, 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 you do the extras, right? You do the hard work. That's where the MVPs are at. So if you want to be an MVP in multifamily, focus on the capex, focus on the construction. Because just buying it, owning it, and just saying, oh, I'm going to charge more rent. Well, how, why, what, what, what's going to, what's going to, why is somebody going to pay you more rent if you're not giving them a better product? Simple as that. I, I, MVP, I do love the hard the, work. Go do the hard work, man. I love to pick with Grant Cardone, right? Because he says a new sheriff's in town, rent's going up. And it's just, that's not true. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, it's not true at all. You know, in some cases you might have, a really bad operator or a really uh, property that hasn't raised the rent in a long time. But just because you're Grant Cardone doesn't mean you can just jack up the rent. People will move out. They don't give a shit who the owner is. If it's Jerome Myers, Josh Cantwell, Grant Cardone, or anybody else. Matter of fact, we don't even really, as the owners, want the residents to know who the owner is. So they don't give a shit who the owner is. What they care about is, is how does your unit compare to the other apartments in this submarket? Right? Do I, am I getting more for my money? So it doesn't matter who the the owner is. <laughs> yeah, man. Okay, so you walk in and do that, don't you? Be like, dude, Jerome Myers is the new sheriff in town, charging more rent. I mean, I'm here. Y'all don't see the truck outside? Like, <laughs> it's worth more. I put my name on it. <laughs> no. Name on it. In fact, you know, if I'm walking units when stuff's going on, they're like, who are you? Oh, I work for the owners. Yeah, yeah. You do? The management company. Yeah, I mean, I do work for the owner. <laughs> I just might be one of them. Anyway, so as you've been going through this CapEx stuff, is there a key lesson that's worth pulling out and saying, hey, guys, don't ever make this misstep? Um, well, certainly, I, I think the biggest thing is going to be under budgeting. Uh, I think this is where the best operators are learning to adjust with the supply chain adjust with the COVID hiccups, adjust with the fact that there really are people are saying, well, nobody wants to work. Well, that's not true. People are experiencing inflation and people are willing to work. They just want to get paid more. So when people are saying like, nobody wants to work, it's because what they're really saying is nobody wants to work for pennies. Nobody wants to work for peanuts. People are willing to work if they're paid reasonable. So I think one of the things that you've got to adjust for now is I'm willing to overpay for labor to get my units turned if I have to, just to keep units, CapEx guys, construction guys, carpenters, plumbers, electricians in units, because the money's going to be made what, by charging more rent and charging more rent over the next five years. But if I've got a unit sitting vacant because I can't get workers, because the workers don't want to work for 13, 14, $18 an hour, they want 25 to $30 an hour you realize now I've got to pay them more than I had to pay them two years ago. And if I pay them more, I, I made the mistake. I've under budgeted on deals that we bought two years ago. Now I'm having to pay more for CapEx, but you know what? I got to tell my investors, I might go over budget, but we're going to get it back because we're going to charge more rent. We're going to get it back. It's going to happen because just trust me. So right now our material costs are about the same, maybe 10, five or 10% more expensive. It's not huge. But labor-wise, in some cases, it's 50% more than we budgeted. It's a lot. Like if I budgeted three, four thousand dollars a unit for labor to turn everything in a unit, it might cost me five or six thousand dollars now. It might cost me significantly more. But my my philosophy is still get the work done, go over budget if you have to, get the unit filled at premium rent, and that will normalize out over the next two or three years. So for sure, under budgeting is a big part of it and underpaying, expecting people to show up on the job and be dependable and not being able to have enough income to feed their families, right? If they can't feed their family, they're not going to come to work, plain and simple. 
<laughs> I love it, Josh. I mean, why fight with the market if you're trying to get something accomplished? Like, how is that going to work? You're, you're going to swim upstream and go fast? It's just yeah. not going to happen. I mean, what I'd rather tell my investors, well, because we syndicate all of our deals, uh, we have a little bit different model. So we're keeping 60 to 80% of our deals and we're giving up 20 to 40% to our investors. But um, would I rather tell those investors that we went over budget, but we still turned everything on time, right? I'd rather turn the units on time if I gave them a two-year CapEx uh, plan or a 15-month CapEx plan. I'd rather be over budget and on time than on budget and way over time, okay? That's my that philosophy. Funny. I'd rather be on time, but over budget because the market will help me charge more rent over time. And I'll be able to get income. I'll be able to show people that there's still an exit, even if I've gone over budget. That's my philosophy. Some guys will be like, don't go over budget, buy yourself more time, turn units a little slower. I don't want to do that because I want to lock in these interest rates at such low rates right now. I'm afraid of what interest rates might be like three to five years from now. So I don't want to have a slow CapEx plan on a fast uh, CapEx plan. And if I got to go over budget a little bit, we will. Wow. Wow. So you got it, ladies and gentlemen. Get in, get out, get it refied, lock in the debt for the next however long you can get it locked in based on your business plan. And then enjoy the rewards on the backside of that. Josh, that's phenomenal. What's As we wrap this up, what's some words of wisdom you would give to our listeners? Um. Look, man, I think there's there's a couple things. I think, again, funding equals freedom. If you want true freedom, you got to own and understand the entire capital stack. Um, you got to make relationships with everybody um, and understand that you, even if you're the CEO of your business, you still have a boss and the boss is the capital stack. The boss is the money, right? So the bank, the mezzanine equity or the mezzanine debt or the pref equity, and then your mom and pop investors that fund that last piece of the capital stack. Ultimately, you work for them. They're the money. So, but understanding that if you provide an amazing return and a good product, they will come back over and over and over and over. So I look at raising capital as a short-term sprint. If we sprint to raise all the capital and make these relationships, then I'm going to be able to run the marathon thereafter. And everybody's going to be running alongside of me. All my investors, all my friends, all the people in the capital stack will be running alongside of me for maybe the next 10 or 15 or 20 years. They'll be partnering with me, doing deals with me. So I don't need to raise capital forever. I need to do that and focus on that in the short term. Uh, that's certainly number one. Own the asset. Number two, people like to flip properties, flip apartments, keep and hold the asset as long as you can. Uh, I don't even really like the model of syndicating and then selling five to seven years from now. Eventually, there's going to be a sale for sure. But again, the richest guys I know, the wealthiest guys I know own 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 units, and they're not proud to sell a building. Like they don't want to ever sell, right? They just want to hold, 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 hold forever. 1031 exchange, and when you can, uh, that's a big deal. Um, and look, the last piece of this, I think, is Within multifamily, there's so many different places that you can play. You could be the expert at CapEx. You could be the expert at property management. You could be the expert at raising money. You could be the expert at finding deals. So it's very much a team game, but you've got to be passionate and love the work that you're doing because it's not easy. It's not easy. Nobody's going to say it's, it's easy, but it's worth it right? Like Tom Brady will tell you that being the greatest quarterback of all time has not been easy. LeBron will tell you he, he's, he, you know, he's, he's been in the gym at two, three, four in the morning. It's not easy, but it's worth it. Uh, and they do it because they have passion for it. They love it. They love the game. They love the journey. Um, to me, that's where it's at. Like, I don't wake up every day, like hoping for like an end point. I don't wake up every day hoping for like, I made it. Like, I want to play the game forever. I want to play the game until I'm ready to just be out of it. Now, some years I might buy one building and take a ton of time off. Other years I might buy six or eight buildings and be working my face off, but I'm passionate for it. So I would suggest everybody that's in multifamily that they just really find out where they're passionate within all this work that needs to be done. What's their little slice of it? Focus on their slice 
and then go work network to find everybody else that has a different passion than they do. So if your passion is in CapEx, go find somebody who's got passion for raising money, finding deals, property management, because you can't do it all. And the deals are big enough that you don't have to do it all. So just get really focused. Think, go back to what we talked about at the beginning here, Jerome. Think about what's important to you. Think about how you operate. Think about what you love to do. And then it's like, man, I got to get up tomorrow and work. I'm excited for that shit, right? That's what, that's, that's where I want to be, right? And as a pancreatic cancer survivor, this is one of the lessons. And I guess Jerome will leave you with this. You don't know when your number is going to be called. I didn't know when my number was going to be called when I was 35 years old. I was healthy. I was freaking ox, man. I was 5%, 6% body fat. I had a beautiful wife and young kids, an amazing house. And my number got called. But at that point, I was passionate for what I was doing. I was loving it. So if I literally had my number called and I was off the face of the earth that year, I would have been okay with that because I was doing what I loved. I was having fun with it. So the question is, is like, if your number gets called, look, man, I had one of my best friend's brothers die this past weekend in his sleep, 50 years old, died in his sleep. Nobody knows why it can happen. So when you're up every day and you're working towards your dreams and you're trying to achieve your goals, there's going to be problems. But if you're in your joy and you love it and you're passionate for it and it's fun, then however long or short your life is, it's going to be fun. That's what it's all about, man. Whoa. Listen, I had an ever dropped the bomb on missteps but that was phenomenal josh thank you so much for sharing with us today we got so much out of this at least i did listeners hey if you didn't get anything out of it you need to start over because josh just dropped jewels all over the place um so to the listeners the pack's with you we'll talk soon a favor give us a five-star rating give us a review and share this with somebody who's interested in multifamily investing Until the next time, the pack is with you.